Welcome everybody. Uh, we are working on unit five today. Um, I'm also realizing my face is going into the video, which I don't like, so I am going to be muting and I'm trying to look at the camera right now. Normally I don't make that effort. Um, it also makes me very self-conscious when I watch myself back. I'll be real frank and I see myself like touching my face or, you know, going like this or something. So I am muting myself so you guys don't have to be burdened with that hideousness. Uh, and now you can just hear the comforting sound of my voice, hopefully. Uh, today's topic within uh, ASP.net is basically uh, a design technique that we use in software called MVC. And MVC stands for Model View Controller. Um, you know, and I, I can see from like a little listing I have here, you know, some people do ref refer to it more as a design pattern. And, th and that's really truly what it is. It's kind of a way to build software that when you have to work both with other people to build it and you're trying to keep program logic data secure and user interface as a separate component that you can design um so they don't kind of pollute each other it really is a logical approach right um there's some pros and cons to it um People are starting to move a little bit away from this in, in some areas, but this is still deeply entrenched in a lot of web apps in particular, uh, but in regular software design as well. So that, that the concept of MVC is kind of a universal one. Um, what I've done here is I'm on the uh, the Geeks for Geeks <laughs> website, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with this site, but this is a pretty cool site. Like when you're trying to look stuff up and you're trying to, um, let's say, you know, educate yourself on something you're learning or you're doing for work or for school or whatever. Uh, this is a really useful site I've found in the past because I think they do a pretty good job of um, explaining things. And I think if I'm not mistaken, I don't know if this is quite a wiki, you know, but it, it allows for contributions from their audience uh, provided their members, right? So if I like, so if I signed in here, I could, you know, hypothetically add or subtract or do, do stuff to this article. All right, you can see this is uh, pretty recently updated. So somebody updated this in February, you know, so you know, five six months ago at from the time I record this video. Uh, and let's just read up on it and, and take a look at some of these graphics. So what I was kind of hoping is to get rid of the ads on the side, and. Um, it's one of those things where I, I kind of like Safari better, where they have like that reading mode. And I, I don't know if um, Chrome offers that yet. And basically what reading mode does is it gets rid of the ads and focuses on the content. So please pretend like I'm not displaying ads on your screen. That is not my intent here. Um, okay, so it says here the MVC design pattern is, is a, a software architecture. And, and you know what? That, that's a good phrase, I think, software architecture. Okay, well, I say a software architecture pattern that separates an application into three main components, the model, the view, and the controller, and it makes it easier to manage and maintain the code base. Okay, in principle, right? And I, I'll give you a little caveat on that later. It also allows for the reusability of components and pr promotes a more modular approach to software development. So that part, I think, is very true and really one of the better aspects of this approach. So in other words, if I build, you know, a thing that I'm putting on a web page, whether it's a functionality or an interface component or even a data model, I can reuse that that component. I don't have to recreate it if I'm doing another project that's similar. Um, I can, in many cases, pick it up and just reuse it. Um, all right. So when they start to break this down. Um, you know, so it says here that the application consists of a data model, presentation information, and control information, and that we split these basically into three different objects, or at least, you know, structures or collections of structures is maybe a better way to think of it. Uh, the MVC pattern um, separates the concerns, and, and that phrase is kind of one of the mainstays of MVC, right? So like when people like lecture on it in formal textbooks, they, they will say MVC promotes the separation of concerns in an application, right? And being that we're using different components, um, 
each one of those components is responsible for basically different parts of the application and how it operates, right? So in other words, you know, for those of you now that are, you know, have like a good amount of HTML and CSS under your belts, so you know how to build a website and kind of make it at least sort of look the way you want, you know, that's a whole process, right? And, and the way that you get a, a website to look nice is by spending time on how it looks, right? Um, and then often, you know, you worry about like what it looks like first, and then you go ahead and you write the, the logic code behind it that makes it do stuff, right? And, and that, that's kind of one of the driving aspects of this, right? So I can design an interface for the user that hits the browser, and I don't have to worry about what mechanical things are happening in the background. I just need to get it on the screen and make it look good, right? That's, that's a thing, right? Uh, in some cases, what I'm sending to the user, like the content, that might be programmatically driven from the back end is handled somewhere else, but ultimately it does get injected into the view. So in other words, if you're a user, right? And so they have this little diagram here and you make a request of an application. So you click on a link or type in information and hit a button or something. That information request is then received by the controller, which is really kind of a collection of um, code you know really and and in often cases it is um methods or functions or objects or classes that have functionality built into them that are receiving the request and then they're like okay well let's see they requested that we just load another page so for example if that's just the request you can just go right from the controller and say oh they just want the other page and you can send that page back and then the user sees it right if the user makes a request that says, well, hey, I need to know this information. Well, then we start looking at the data models, right? So like that will have a way, well, they're looking for information X, right? So it goes into the data model, finds information X relative to their criteria, returns it to the controller. The controller takes that piece of information and then says, oh, all right, well, now we need to send that information back to the view, and then it comes back to the browser, right? So there's kind of this thing that happens in the back end. So any logic is usually in the controller or controllers, plural. There usually is one master controller for most apps. And it's not unusual, though, however, to have one controller that kind of reaches out to other code and pulls in those pieces, especially if it's built with components, right? So like if you had a component you pulled in that does a certain thing, that controller might call on that component, and then the controller reaches out to the model, pulls back the data, marries it with that component, does its little functionality, and then generates information that goes back to the view and gets inserted into the template that you've created for the web, right? Um, so you can see there's a lot going on here, right? In terms of the conceptually what you have to build because all those different things I'm talking about require coding, right? So instead of building like one large application or one web page that has some JavaScript on it or something, you are building lots of little pieces that are working together, right? And, and if you're not aware of this, you know, welcome to the real world of software development. That's really how it's typically done. Uh, especially with large scale applications, you know, it's not, it's hardly ever one singular file doing all the work. All right. So let, let, let's read through this now. And it says the model component MDC uh, represents the data that, and the business logic of the application. And, you know, I, I think of it as a way to interface with your data. We saw how to do this in the previous tutorial um, where we built a C sharp file that declared basically getters and setters for different types of data fields, whether it was text or numbers or date time or whatever, right? Um, often that model creates that same pattern. Once again, it's a pattern that represents what might be in some storage mechanism like a database or a text file or some other external resource, right? And the model is not the data. And I wanna be really, really clear about that, right? The model is a structure for the data within the app. It is not the data itself and maybe not the actual structure of the data itself. It can, that gets even weirder. But that, that is how it operates, right? So that, there's a separation between that. That's why 
the database or whatever your data store is sits separate from the model. The model becomes an intermediary uh, in between your application and the database. Um, the other thing that I think that's kind of interesting, and you notice they have this terminology here, it says abstraction layer. And what that indicates is that depending on the software tools you're using, there often is, I'm trying to think of the right way to say this. I don't want to say dumbed down. That's where my brain goes first, but a, a gentler way to interface with the data than necessarily needing to write SQL queries, right? Um, sometimes you have to break it down to that. So like if you've taken, let, let's say the Java programming two class with me, when we interface with databases, we do write, we do write Java code that specifies a SQL query. And then we send that off to a database and pull data back. What an abstraction layer does is it uses a, in some cases, a secondary syntax or language in order to abstract the data from the database. It really does get converted to SQL code, um, but you don't have to worry about that. You just have to worry about the logic of it, right? So the abstraction layer is really kind of like a logical layer for extracting or manipulating the data in the database without actually writing the SQL query. What we saw in the previous tutorial was that we use what we call uh, LINQ or link, uh, you know, and this is very common in Microsoft.NET applications. That is their abstraction layer is link, right? Uh, when I taught MVC using Ruby on Rails, they had their own database extraction or abstraction layer too, right? Like you would write these like weird like commands at the command line and press enter and it would basically write a query for you. Right, but it was in like more English-like language. And yeah, there's a little bit of a learning curve uh, to that, but it's not really that bad, right? But the, the idea is the abstraction layer takes a little bit of that um, heaviness out of it, you know, or, you know, the, the need to write a SQL query to do it correctly for whatever thing you're doing. Um, all right, so um, the view, let's move on to that piece, right? The view is, Okay, and it says displays the data from the model to the user and sends user inputs to the controller. So it does two things, right? So it puts up a screen, right? That is both receiving stuff from the application and showing it to you, right? Like, um, you know, like a piece of information from the database, for example. But it also is providing uh, the interface to send requests back to the application, sometimes with specific information, right? Like you're doing a specific query, you're looking for a certain thing, or, um, you know, you, you're moving a slider or clicking a drop down, or hitting a button or typing in a number or whatever that happens to be, whatever logic drives that. So the view receives information to present, but it also gives you the interface with which to interact with the application to send inputs to the controller, right? And it says it's passive and does not directly interact with the model. Correct, right? And you can see that from the drawing, right? So that it doesn't it in any way interact with the data model at all. Uh, instead, it receives data from the model and sends user inputs to the controller for processing, right? And you can see that it's kind of, in, in a sense, kind of a closed loop with the request to the controller whatever that happens to do to get the data to go back to the screen, but it might just send you to a different page, you know, at the same time. So that, that that's kind of a little closed loop there. Uh, from the controller aspect, it says the controller acts as an intermediary between the model and the view. It handles the user input, updates the model accordingly, and updates the view to reflect the changes in the model. Right now, now they're making it sound like you're gonna take your data and change its structure. Well, sometimes you can do that. Uh, but generally what that means is like how you're interfacing with that data. What are you querying? What, you know, things are you pulling back? Uh, like, and if you're looking at like at a database table, do you need all 20 fields or do you just need three of them? You know, that, that, that type of thing. All right. So uh, it contains the application logic. So like the, the work that your app is doing really kind of gets handled there. Right. And um, as an input validation and transformation tool that makes sure that the data being sent from the view is valid. We can also validate that in the view. And I think we saw a little bit of that. And then we can also take data and if necessary, transform it into what it needs to be to either work with the application or the database or both, right? 
um, and so yes, we can we can validate in the browser. We can use JavaScript. I think we we kind of saw how that that worked. But then the application itself can also validate the data. And then the last place you want to have to do data validation is in your database, right? Because with the database, especially if you're writing an application that interfaces with it, you don't want to, you're not like writing queries to create the database. You're just writing queries to send and store and retrieve and change information, the CRUD stuff from the database. You're not worried about the design of the database. That is possible with an MVC application, but that's not really what the intent is. The the component the components do talk to each other, right? So the, let's kind of follow through the stream here because I think they did a really nice job of kind of explaining it. Um, okay, so it says this below is a communication flow that it ensures that each component is responsible for a specific aspect of the application's functionality, leading to a more maintainable and scalable architecture. So user interaction with the view. The user interacts with the view, such as clicking a button or entering text into a form. Okay, makes sense. Views or view receives user input. All right, so we type something in, we move a slider, drop down, et cetera, et cetera, or we click a button or just click a link, right? Once that input's received, then we are forwarding it to the controller. You know, so like once that submit is hit or the link is clicked, we're forwarding to the controller. The controller receives it, right? And then the controller processes the user input. It receives the user input from the view. It interprets the input, performs any necessary operations such as updating the model and decides how to respond, right? And, you know, well, it's not, you know, the controller, you know, deciding it's you with your programming logic deciding and then telling the controller what to do. The controller updates the model based on the user input or application logic. So in other words, all right, let's say, hey, I want to change my address in the database. Here's my new address, update it, right? So this is kind of what they're referring to for changing stuff, for example, or creating something new. The model notifies the view of changes. If the model changes, it notifies the view, but, and I think they, what they should have added here is that goes through the controller. It doesn't happen directly, right? And you can see that in that graphic, right? The model talks back to the controller, the controller delivers it to the view, right? So it does not go from the model to the view ever, right? View requests on the data from the model, the view requests data from the model to update its display, okay? And I think that's pretty intuitive. The controller updates the view based on the changes in the model or in response to the user input. You know, so if I log in to a website, for example, it might give me access to things I don't have if I'm not logged in, right? Um, so yeah, that that controls the view relative to what you're doing on the screen. The view renders the updated UI. So if you tell the controller, hey, you know, put a thing up on the screen so I can change my address, the controller will write, you know, or send that code back to the browser so that you can make that action happen, right? Um, so they have a little example here of the MVC design pattern. Um, and I'm going to try to zoom in here and all I'm doing is making, right, making the ads even bigger. Uh, but what they're doing here is they're, uh, they're showing an example of an app where the model seems to be a student and you can see that the student has it looks like, I don't know, this is a role number or ID number or something like that uh, as a string and a name as a string. And then they have a few different uh, methods here for getting and setting those data fields. So this is basically a data model with getters and setters, right? Similar to what we did in C Sharp. Now, the modeling that they're doing here, by the way, is for Java, but the concepts are identical, right? They really, really truly are. Then we have the controller which uses the student model. So basically this data structure is available to it and it also can propagate the view. So those are kind of its, its tie-in. So, so in other words, the controller knows what view it's pushing to and it also knows what data it's working with, right? And then inside that student controller, they have, um, you know, the student controller 
gets and sets each one of the things that are relative inside the student. And it also has the ability to update the view directly. So all the capabilities of the student model and all the ability to push content to the view is embedded within that controller. And then ultimately the view will basically just be, you know, receiving the content, right? It's, it, it's kind of like just echoing content, right? We're just writing code that writes the HTML that then pushes to the browser to be displayed, right? Kind of like we do in PHP, for example. So they go through this process here and, and I'm not gonna like, like look at their Java code. It's not my intent here. Um, but they talk about, you know, you know, just to kind of get the conception behind th this piece here, right? So they talk about the student class. It represents the student's name and role number. Think of it as an ID number and provides methods to access and modify this data. So data fields and then getters and setters. Remember in C-sharp, they, they streamline all this. You, you provide the, the variable type and name and then you just do a little get set after it and, and, and you can avoid writing the getters and setters separately. The view basically just has a way to put the stuff back on the screen. Now the example they're using here for Java is just a console app. So that's still an interface though, right? So they're just system out print lining or you know echoing to the screen. For us it would be echoing into HTML structures. So you may have built this beautiful looking website and you got this one spot on the page where information is going to pop up, right? Or in some cases, complete HTML structures pop up too, but that's handled by the code in, in the view, basically. The controller, we kind of think of this as a spot where it allows you to send information to it, performs the logic, interfaces with the data, if necessarily it retrieves the data uh, and then sends it back to the view in the format that it's supposed to. And that's all controlled with code. And that's kind of what they're trying to demonstrate here. So you'd still have getters and setters, but then you also have ways to basically update the view or push stuff out to the screen. Um, yeah, and in this case, we're just outputting text right in this Java example, but for us, it would be HTML or whatever the view is supporting. Right. They uh, they go on with this example, and you, you can study that if you wish, but they show the output of it. But I, this is the part I did want to look at um, so we get that fundamental underpinning of this, and then we'll get into doing the tutorial. The first thing I'm going to say is, you know, in, in terms of advantages, here's that, that phrase I was talking about, the separation of concerns, right? So MBC separates the different aspects of an application, the data, the UI and the logic, making the code easier to understand, maintain and modify. And then from a professional standpoint as well, you can assign those components to different people. So you, you might be the model person or you might be the controller person or you might be the view person or you might be two of those things or some of those things now and one of those things later, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and and not, a, not atypical in a large coding environment that people uh, have very specific tasks like that. It also has modularity. Each thing, model viewer control, can be developed, tested separately, promoting code reusability and scalability. And who wouldn't want that, right? You know, modularity is important. You create something cool, you don't want to have to recreate it. Easy to move from one app to the other. Easy to find the spot where something is broken and just fix that piece or replace that piece or whatever. Flexibility, uh, since the components are independent, changes to one component does not affect the others. So if I decide to change, let's say the header of my homepage and whatever, you know, that, that has nothing to do with the model, nothing to do with the controller, nothing to do with the coding logic or the data structure. That's just, the, that's just what it looks like, right? So I don't have to worry if I'm changing content on the view that I'm breaking the other things. So that's really cool. Parallel development, multiple developers can work on different components simultaneously. Didn't they just say that? Yep. And the benefit of that is development goes faster, right? Also another thing uh, in high demand in industry. Uh, code's reusable. So we can reuse the code. If I create a really cool thing, I can use it in other parts of my app or in different projects altogether, right? Um, once again, saving time. 
There are some disadvantages, though. So it's not that that we shouldn't point these out because I think they are important and and relevant, really. Um, so one problem would be complexity. Um, if you're building something that's really, really simple, you might go, or at least an intelligent developer would would start to ask the question, do I really need to do all this MVC stuff? I mean, we're just doing this. You know, that, that's the kind of mindset you, you have to put in. So you can add significant unnecessary complexity to an application that really isn't necessary in some cases. Um, and then that in itself makes the development process slower. So apply this when it's appropriate is a good way to, to look at it. There is a learning curve. So you're not just gonna jump in right away and be an excellent MVC developer. Uh, it takes time. Um, if you're stepping into an environment where this technique is already in place, if, even if you know how to do the work from scratch, you have to learn what their logic was and fit into their paradigm, which could be antiquated, it could be modern, who knows, right? We, we really don't know that. Um, overhead, right? So when you're working with things that are, you know, basically separate pieces that are working together, it can lead to more overhead is how they're saying it, basically affecting the per performance of the app application, especially if you're operating on, you know, platforms that don't have a lot of robust computing power, right? So if I'm, if I'm working on a big powerful server and I have the whole run of the server and I'm, and it's doing all this like data transmission and one thing talking to the other, not a big deal. Right. But if maybe um, I'm writing an application that, requires a certain amount of resources and the resources aren't there. Well, yeah, you could see that that could maybe make your application not work very efficiently, leading to user frustration, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, you know, I, I think that even an MVC app though can be very, very efficient if you design it well, you know? Uh, there is that problem in modern application development where it's really easy to throw in tools and APIs and really make something very, very bloated when it doesn't need to be, um, especially I think with very large JavaScript libraries being attached, that's that's usually a big problem. There is the potential for over-engineering. So we're kind of overthinking the solution. Um, and, and they say here, developers may over-engineer the application by adding unnecessary abstractions and layers leading to bloated and hard to maintain code, right? And even if it's built on solid logic, you know, sometimes you don't have to get super complex, you know, um, you know, and I don't, I don't have a good analogy for that, but I think you guys can see what I'm talking about here. Uh, there is an increased file count. So instead of like maybe having, I don't know, you saw how many we were doing when we just did a razor page, right? I mean, you very quickly start adding HTML files and code files and JavaScript files and APIs and yada, yada, yada. And then in MVC, you break that down even further so you might have a very simple application that may have dozens and dozens, dozens of components and pages and models and and yeah, it, it creates a lot of files, right? So, um, so that's a negative for sure. All right, I think that that's enough of an underpinning of what MVC is and how it operates. Um, let's now get our hands, you know, a little dirty and get into actually working with. Uh, with that, I, sorry about the YouTube dashboard there, but hey, my subscribers are up, you know, all rejoice. Um, all right, so there's this link here. Uh, I'll make sure that I share it in the video posting. It is available within the course show if you guys wanna pull it up on your own screen. Um, I am gonna zoom in ever so slightly here, make it a little bit bigger, but not too big. I think that's pretty good. Um, they do talk about here, um, you know, the fact that they did have that other tutorial and the fact that whenever you're building an app, you need to think about which user interface or approach you're going to use to kind of push stuff out there. Uh, of course, my, Microsoft's latest kind of thing is Blazor, you know, which is kind of like an Angular React kind of thingy, <laughs> politely. Uh, I'm not focusing on that one, but I do find that the MVC one is, is pretty critical. Um, all right, so 
they make a little point here and it says at the end of the series you'll have an app that manages and displays movie data sounds familiar so we're kind of doing the same thing again but we're a little differently you know uh in terms of how it, it's structured so we're going to make the app we're going to add and scaffold a model right so we already kind of know what that means we're going to work with the database always a plus and then add search and validation something we've already done but just in a different format so a lot of this is very very familiar which should help to speed us up a little bit. Um, they do expect that you have Visual Studio 2022 installed with the ASP.NET and web development stuff uh, at a minimum. And then they have us begin. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring up Visual Studio and I'm gonna start getting these steps going here. Um, so I'm gonna complete these steps and I'll, and I'll bounce back and forth. I'm kind of looking at this on two screens at the same time, so. If you're wondering if I'm pulling it out of thin air, I am not. <laughs> All right. So we're going to go ahead and create a new project. All right. And we're going to choose the MVC architecture now. So we want to make sure we're, we're C sharp. Um, we are pushing to the web. And then we're going to look for ASP.NET Core web app with model view controller. And then you can kind of scroll down here until you see it and i am just seeing it right now here on my screen All right so this is the one you want to select keep it there for just a second and then i'm going to go ahead and click next all right so now it doesn't help that we already created a thing called movies or whatever <laughs> you know so now we're going to like name it something different so we can make it different from the previous project and what they're suggesting that we name it is mvc movie okay I want you to notice two capital m's the vc are lowercase um, the reason that's important to, to mimic is because we are going to be dealing with namespaces and if we're copying any other blocks of code and we start changing namespaces and you start to get underlined. So I would recommend just following it uh, precisely. Go ahead and click next uh, if you haven't done so already. We are gonna be working uh, with uh, .NET 8 here, long-term support version. Uh, I believe you know, from my quick perusal of this, that anything, you know, .NET 7 will probably be fine too, maybe even .NET 6. Um, they're leaving HTTPS checked, so we will too. Um, we are not checking the box that says, do not use top level statements. We're leaving that unchecked. And then we are gonna go ahead and click uh, create. And here we are in the project. And you know, the first thing that we're gonna do, and this is kind of, um, you know, whenever you're working with a new template really inside of uh, .NET, I always think it's a good idea to just take a look over at your solution explorer in the right sidebar there and familiarize yourself with what, what is different here than like the other ones I've done, right? And what's the same. So the first thing that I notice is, well, you know what? There is a program.cs file. Right. And when I look inside of it, it looks like a lot of the stuff that we've seen before. Maybe a couple little differences, but basically it, it you know, this is kind of like the main uh, main program, you know, is the way to look at it. The one thing that we do see that's different though is we do have folders for controllers, models, and views. And you know, I'm not sure why they call it model view controller, <laughs> you know, why that that order. Um but you know the alphabetical orders controller models and views we do still have a www root folder here you can expand that if you wish you, you can see that there's css is already there uh, javascript is already there and there's a library here that already pre-includes right this is part of the template bootstrap jquery jquery for validation um, and a default favorites icon <laughs> that's already on board, right? And all linked up, right? All you have to do is utilize it. Now, if you were to not use any jQuery or not use Bootstrap as your templating engine or whatever, you can remove those, right? And do your own thing. That, that's not a requirement. What 
does happen though. So many people are using Bootstrap and jQuery regularly, right? And this is kind of a tip that they just kind of consider it an automatic, right? So there it is. Um, in the, the JavaScript and CSS folders, these are essentially, not that they're blank, but they're close to blank. You know, they're just really basic files. The JavaScript file is blank. CSS has just a couple little defaults in there. Uh, of course, if you had any static content you would add to your website, whether that's an HTML file, uh, images, movies, what have you, right? This is the spot where you would put that content. You can create a folder for it that's logically named. So if you were adding images, you would want to call that folder images or something of the sort, right? Um, and then that is uh, directly accessible um, through the project using, you know, regular, you know, file and folder nomenclature, basically. Now, the model view controllers, let's start first with, with, with the view folder and take a look inside there. You will notice that with the views, there's a home page, right? And a home folder, actually. Uh, and that's got an index and a privacy thing. And then there's a shared folder. And then you notice with the shared folder and some of the files inside this views folder that some of them are prefaced with an underscore. And this has a special meaning actually when you're working um, with these formats. And, and what, what it's really showing you is componentized information, right? Uh, in some cases we call these uh, partials um, or templates or whatever. Um, and they're not necessarily like primary content pages or views, you know, they're portions of that or used by those other things to create what they're doing. Um, some of these here do have C sharp code behind them and some do not. Right. And, and it just depends on what those pages are. Um, but you can see the structure here for the views. In the models folder, um, right now there's only an error uh, model, right? So like what your error would look like if, if you were generating an error message, uh, but any data models we would build would go here. And then we have the controllers folder. And you notice there's this thing in here already called the, the home controller. And if you click in there, you'll notice that it has some basic things inside here already added to the application which you can remove and change or just simply alter. Um, you know, it just depends on what you're doing. And, and, and what you do in this file um, will control a lot, right? Because this is the controller file. And most people, when they build MVC apps, usually have one big controller file, you know, but it depends, you know, real frankly. Um, so any like functionality that I would like throw in probably will go here in terms of either rendering a page or retrieving data or changing data or sending stuff back to a view, right? This is the spot where a lot of that will be controlled. So that's kind of your overall anatomy, you know, of the, what I think are the important folder shit. It's like the bottom ones here, really the, the key ones. All right, now going back here. So we completed that step, right? Um, now they're asking us to run it. Now, we, we were talking about this a lot last time. We want to do control F5 to run stuff right now because we really don't necessarily want the debugger running. There is um, nothing added to the app yet, so it should work, right? But the other thing that we do when we, we launch an app for the first time is we're doing what we call a clean build, right? Which means we're running code to make sure it works at least once, you know, and... Uh, here it comes up in uh, my browser. Now you notice this looks a lot like our other uh, ASP.NET Core stuff, right? It, it does, you know, and uh, and why? Because, well, it's using Bootstrap as its template and it's using, you know, whatever Microsoft has determined is a good basic format, right? And here we go, you know, we have, we have a home page, we have a, a privacy page, which is blank because we haven't added anything to it, um, but that's it, right? Um, so it does run right um and if you do happen to get right like if you're new to this and haven't done it before if you get the ssl warnings you can just follow the directions here to 
accept the certificate or just ignore it or whatever you want to do, right? That's only happening because we chose to configure HTTPS. I'm not always a fan of doing that, but I'm trying to follow the tutorial just in case, right? It comes into play. But, you know, if, if we're not logging into anything, it's really kind of irrelevant, right? It is considered good practice though for development always to do SSL because most websites, you know, without it are kind of problematic. Um, all right. Uh, if you wanted to see, you can launch that start without debugging from the debug menu. Control F5 is, I think, just easier. Moving on to step two, uh, we're next going to add a controller. So we're going to get started on this before we take our break, just so you guys know. Um, so they, they once again kind of talk about the whole NBC structure here, and I suppose I could kind of keep that heading up there for a second at least. Um, okay, so it says here, the MVC pattern helps you create apps that are more testable and easier to update than traditional monolithic apps. Uh, MVC-based apps contain models, right? Classes that represent the data of the app. Uh, model classes use validation logic to enforce business rules for that data. Typically model objects retrieve and store model state in a database. In this tutorial, a movie model retrieves movie data from a database and provides it to the view or updates it. Updated data is written to the database. Okay, so that's uh, that's pretty good you know, description. The views are the components that display the app's user interface. Generally, this UI displays the model data, right? Because what are we looking at, right? A dump of the table, right, is what we're saying. Controllers are classes that handle browser requests, receive or retrieve model data, and call view templates that return a response. So when we do MVC, it's just reiterating the fact that the view only displays information, right? Um, the controller handles and responds to the user input. Uh, and then they kind of give you examples here. So for example, um, you know, if we are to hit the privacy page, this tells basically the home controller to trigger the privacy action or the method called privacy inside of the controller. And so that, so the URL here is not at all file and folder it is, or parameter passing, right? Which is what we saw last time. It is actually calling specific methods within, within specific files, right? If we wanna get into the point where we're editing something, we can also come up with URLs that are similar to the ones that we used before, where we're calling you know, a certain thing and we're gonna edit movie number five, right? And so we're gonna get to that point. And they are going to talk about the routing data. So like we can we can set up routing so we control like how the URLs operate if we so choose, right? And that that's really kind of dependent on the kind of app you're building and, and what the logic of it is. All right. I think my my feeling here is I, I thought I would add a controller, but you know what? Let, let's take a five minute break and we'll come back and do that. So we're going to pick up here in five minutes, folks. All right, so we're back from our break and we're going to move on to this next step here, which is to add a controller. And um, they give us some basic instructions here. So we're going to use the right click approach. And I want you to notice that they're right clicking on top of the controllers folder. And this will kind of give you a good indication of like what happens when you build one, right? All right, so let's go ahead and do that particular step here. So I'm gonna go ahead and do the right click in Visual Studio. So I'm coming to the controllers folder here in Solution Explorer, I'm doing a right click. I am choosing add, and then, you know, and I want you to notice here because it is kind of context aware that right at the top of the list when I right click on the uh, add thing, it, it has controller, right? Because that's the most common thing you're going to put in controllers folder. Makes sense, right? So we're just going to go ahead and choose controller. 
it will bring up this dialogue box here. And I want you to, to notice that even the terminology in the box, right? It says, add new scaffolded item, right? And so once again, the scaffolding is kind of like this weird thing that happens with MVC because in other words, we, by doing this process, we might build more than just one thing in the process. We might build a whole collection of things that build on top of each other kind of like a scaffold they're kind of connected and it's a framework you know basically they do want us to choose the empty pattern right i do want you to to notice that there are other choices so mvc with read write actions mvc with views using edity framework which is the microsoft -y way to kind of interface with databases using their their other abstraction tool basically uh, but we're choosing empty for right now. We're going to do some kind of simple fundamental things. So go ahead and click add, right? You'll get another box that comes up and they want you basically to name it at this point is what they're doing. So like the, the typical convention, just by the way, is that you leave the word controller in a controller, right? Now, it's kind of thinking that we're going to replace the home controller. I'm not really aiming to do that, but I do want to just do a hello world basically is what I'm trying to build here. So we're going to get rid of the word home and instead we're going to say hello world controller. We're going to get rid of that number one that's not needed there. And then we'll go ahead and click add. Now you notice it's already on MVC controller empty, right? And that's the one that we want. And then um, this just builds out basically a, a CS file, right? Um, notice the namespace, right? That we have a class um, based upon what we decided to call it and that it extends the super class of controllers. So we have all the capabilities of whatever controllers can do built into this automatically. That's the, the extends syntax. Now there is an a method already included inside here, you know, before I go on to the next step here, I just want to point this out. And it's called I action result, which is the default action that happens when I simply load up or call the URL for hello world. And it will launch what we call the, the index method, which returns a view. Okay, now what that view is, well, that's determined by something else. However, right, what we're going to do is we're going to just hotwire this a little bit and change it. So like if you look at the Microsoft tutorial here, right, so we did these steps and now we're here. What they're having us do is we're going to replace all of that code with this code. But I did want to show you what it looked like before. This is how a default controller looks but we're gonna replace all of that code with the code that you see here. And I think in this case, since we're adding a using statement, um, let's just grab all of it. All right, so I'm just gonna hit the copy button here, uh, back over to Visual Studio, do a Control A, select all, Control V to paste it in. Um, you know, you're always like pensive, like, hey, I'm looking for the red underlines. No red, under red underlines happened, right? So that that's pretty good. Now. We added um, this using library here. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure why this one is really necessary actually, because you, you see it's grayed out, it's not really being used, but you know, they put it in there. Um, the index method is replaced. So instead of like returning the view method, it's actually returning a snippet of text. And if you want, I'm just putting it out there, this could be HTML inside the double quotes here, if you wished, right? This will respond to a URL get that where we take the local web server and append hello world, you know, with a capital H and W to the URL, and it will return this text. If I append this URL, it will then return the welcome method. So you notice the index is not named for the controller. That happens automatically if I call that controller. And then if I want to trigger a method inside the controller, I call the controller and its method in, in that fashion. All right, so um, 
they're making a little point here in the tutorial, and I suppose it's probably worthy of reading it since we're trying to be studious here, right? Um, that it says every public method in a controller is, is callable as an HTTP endpoint. So in other words, it kind of sort of creates its own route, um, right? So if we want to just call the index method, we just call the controller um, and then take a look. If we want to call the method inside that controller, we call the controller then the method. Let's go ahead and do a run and call up hello world and see if it works. I guess that would be a good starting point. So control F5 on this. So we're doing it without debugging. Wait for it to launch here. I should probably pull up my console just a little bit. It looks like it's running, but of course I'm not there, so. All right, so it's for me, it's running here, and I'm going to now append to the URL hello world uppercase, uppercase HNW. And you can see now it is pulling back, you know, the text I put in there. If I go ahead and append to the URL and pull in the welcome method in the form of get, uh, now it is pulling in that text. So, in other words, I have the capability from my URL to trigger which method I'm using inside of this controller. Pretty cool, really, right? I mean, if you, if you think about it that way. So um, if you write a really fancy method, it does a whole bunch of work and calculations and interacts with data and whatever it does, right? Um, it's callable from a single URL. So you can just set up a link on a page, you hit a button, all this stuff happens, and there it is, voila, magic on the screen. Um, so I think that's um, a, a pretty helpful little underpinning there uh, for this. All right, so for us, it worked just fine. Now, if we take it a little further, right, um, you know, and, and they're, they're saying here, MVC invokes controller classes and the action methods within them, depending on the incoming URL. The default URL L routing logic used by MVC uses a format like this to determine what code to invoke. So it comes controller, action name or the method, right? And then the parameters that you're feeding to it, right? The routing format is preset in the program.cs file. So let's just take a kind of a look at that really quick and make sure that that's actually the case. And you notice down here, right? Map controller route. Right. And so the controller name, the action, and the idea, and you see how that's an optional, right? So if you um, have that, whatever, if you don't, you know, but it, optional in the case because you're feeding a parameter and that may, may or may not work with what you're doing. But, you know, the, the point is that's what that next position would be for. Um, right. And I think we, we kind of proved how this all works. Um, but this, in this case, that, that third thing is for basically passing parameters or information around the application. So now it says modify the code to pass some parameter information from the URL to the controller. You know, so for example, you would say, hello world, welcome, question mark name equals Rick uh, and num times four, okay. And what they're going to have us do here is they're going to have us change the welcome method to include two parameters as shown in the following. So go ahead and just copy that code. Let's bring it into Visual Studio and then take a look. So we're going to be looking at the Hello World controller. We're replacing this welcome method. I'm replacing the comments too because I noticed they did have some, right? And Okay, so this makes sense now why they're using it because this this piece needs that using statement up top. And you see how that changed to white now instead of being grayed out? All right, so what it tells us here is that when we call welcome, welcome is going to be expecting that we send two parameters, not one, but two. One would be a name, and then the second one would be an integer that's preset to one if we don't send it anything, right? And so what it's gonna say uh, is hello, whatever name we send it, 
the number of times as and report back that number. I want you to look at the return statement. Also, they're using a, 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 a method here called HTML encoder .default encode. And you'll notice here that this, it, we're using like, you know, the uh, string interpolation here, right? So we're using a dollar sign at the beginning here, right before the double quotes to indicate that we're directly injecting variable names. Now, where do the variables come from? Well, they come from the parameter list here, right? Um, but we're directly injecting those parameters into that encoded string, which then is gonna go back to the browser. Okay, so that's um, the directive. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna run the app again, and then we're gonna, we're gonna browse to hello world, welcome. And then I want you to look at that syntax really carefully, right? Like, and, and if helpful, you could just, you know, well, actually you could grab this, all of this piece here, right? So instead of typing it manually, you can see if it works. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna control C, copy that. And um, it is currently running. So I don't know if it will elegantly adjust. I guess we're gonna find out here in a second. Uh, I also got a little message on my screen that my internet's unstable, so I don't know if that's me or if it's the outside world, but all right, let's just try um, hitting the original URL, hello world. Okay, so that's still loading. And then let's add uh, welcome to it. Okay, so this is working too. Um, And now we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna append the rest of it. So let me just paste that in there. So you notice, oh, I have two slashes here though. So be careful of that. So we're gonna do hello world, welcome, question mark, because now we're sending parameters. That's how you're gonna send a parameter here. Um, and what are we sending parameters to specifically that um, method, right? And that accepts two parameters, one being name, and we're setting that to the text Rick and the number of times four. And now that that's in there, I'm going to go ahead and press enter. And it's not working. Now I, I'm assuming that's not working um, because I never reran the app. So I'm going to go ahead and close that browser tab. I'm going to be clever though and copy this URL. So I don't have to retype it. So let's repropagate the web server but that proves that you have to relaunch your web server. Um, and what are we gonna do here? We're gonna do control F5 to relaunch. One more time, I don't think that took. Control F5, okay, there it goes. All right, so there's the browser. I'm just gonna paste right into the, the URL now, the revised, uh, syntax, right? So hello world, welcome, question mark, name equals Rick, ampersand number times equal four. And so now you see what it's doing, right? It's sending the text in and it's sending a number in as well, right? And it's reading both of those and then pushing it back to the screen. So um, it shows that, what does it show? It shows a couple of things. It shows that the controller is receiving the information from the URL it's processing that information and then pushing it back to a view as we designate it. And, and albeit a very simple view, but still it is a view, right? All right, let me just pause here for a second. All right, so a couple takeaways from this, right? So aside from the fact that we were able to alter one of the things and that send that information through the URL see it back in the browser and have it you know work correctly um right so we use the old-fashioned get method to basically push that information out there kind of like the same thing you do when you do a google search your, your information is sent out there kind of the same way now it says here that you know in the previous image right we didn't use the parameters right so in other words we didn't go like hello world welcome and then send the parameters after slashes, we sent the parameters in that format. 
uh, name and number of time parameters are passed in the query string, which we already learned about. The question mark is a separator, and the ampersand uh, separates all the, the, the value pairs that we're sending in, so key value. Now they want us to replace the method with the following code. Right? So notice a little, little bit of a difference. So I'm going to do that again. So we're, once again, we're replacing the welcome method. So back over to Visual Studio. Pasting it in, right? Slightly, slightly different uh, lay of the land here. You know, this time we're sending in string name and ID, right? Instead of number of times. Um, and let's see what happens on, on, on this encounter. So like if I do uh, the following, so run the app and enter the following URL. So let's just repropagate the app. So I'm gonna close the browser tab, back to Visual Studio, Control F5, or run without debugging, one of those two. And then they want us to hit this URL and I'm just gonna append the URL. And I want you to look at the format of this one that they're having us do. And of course, now I'm missing the slash, so I gotta make sure I get that slash in there. Um, and so the, the format's like controller name, method, and then it says three comma name equals Rick. Okay, that doesn't seem to make sense, but it still worked. Now, why does it work? All right. It works because first of all, name Rick is attributed to the variable name that we're sending it into. How does it know then that the number belongs to ID, right? And, and this is kind of what they're trying to point out here, I think. They're, um, okay. It says the, the third URL segment matched the route parameter ID, right? So the welcome method contained a parameter ID that matched the URL template and the map controller route method and the trailing question mark starts the query string. So in other words, it's looking at this um, to determine that basically, right? And so we put in the ID number first, right? And then we put in a question mark to send it a regular query string and then that put it in the right place because we told it where to put it, right? Um, you know, so the I think maybe that the important takeaway here is that the trailing question mark and the ID question mark indicates that it's optional, right? So you can include it or not include it, right? So either one. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next page here. All right, so now we're moving on to part three, which is adding a view uh, to the app. And they do a little bit of a preface here, not a whole lot. It says, uh, you're gonna modify the hello world controller to use Razor view files. This cleanly encapsulates the process of generating HTML responses to the client also makes it look better, right? And view templates are created using Razor and Razor-based view templates have that CS HTML extension, right? That's just how they operate. Uh, and it gives you a great way to create um, basically HTML using C Sharp. All right, so it says, currently the index method returns a string with a message in the controller class and it just goes right to the view and you can see that code before and it says um, in that controller class replace the index method with the following code so let's do that so right now they want us to just return the view there in other words put it back to what it was is what they're what they're saying so I'm, I'm just changing that part so I'm going to go back here and instead of saying you know return this is my default action I am instead just going to return a view right I am getting an underline, which is a little concerning, right? And I'm and I'm wondering why. Ah, okay. Uh, the other piece here, right, is this piece. So I action result, right? Because if you look here, this indicates what we're returning, which before was a string, and now we're returning 
an action result, <laughs> you know, so that's um, why the red underline. So an action result means we're calling the method. Right, so the coding is done. Um, and it says controller methods are referred to as action methods. For example, the index action method in the preceding code. That, so that's an action method. Generally, uh, an I action result or class derived from action result, not a type like string, right? But in, in order to get our text on the screen, we had to return a string. Now we're going to go ahead and add a view. And you know what? Um, I guess we don't need to write it quite yet. They didn't say to do that. So, all right. Now we're going to add a view. We're going to right click on that views folder and then add a new folder and name the folder hello world. So we're going to right click the views folder for this. So right click, add a new folder. They want us to add the name on this. And I, I just want to make sure that I'm getting it right here. Of course, on my other screen, I have to scroll way down. It wasn't even on the right page. All right, there we go. Uh, and we're going to name the folder. And if that just happened to you, I, you can you can just right click and rename. And they want us to call this hello. Then we're going to right click that folder. And once again, we're going to choose add new item, right? And it brings up this interface and it's going to bring up uh, a CS template, and which I think is kind of um, kind of interesting here because is that really what I want, right? Yes, yeah, kind, of, kind of the question you have to ask yourself. But instead, what we're going to do is we're going to click show all templates, and then it gives you this more complicated uh, interface here. And what we're going to do is we want what we're looking for is basically a razor view that's empty, and that's not what we have currently selected. Now, you can find this in a few different ways. It knows what language we're using. Right, um, and so it's putting up everything that works relative to that language. And yeah, I do see it on the list right here, right? But if you have a list that pops up, right, and it's like really complicated, right? And you, and, you know, you can narrow down the results by like just putting in search words, right? So I'm looking for a razor view that's empty, right? So that, that is selected. All right, we're going to go ahead and um, also look at the name down here. So while, while we're at it, and, and notice the name is index.cshtml. And then we're going to go ahead and click add, right? And now you can see the file dropped into the Hello World folder. Right? Um, all right, so now they want us to take the contents of that file now, and actually, and, and I, I feel kind of compelled to talk about this too, right? You will notice here, it's like, wow, this is a really bizarre looking code in this file. Well, <clears throat> first of all, whenever you're in a file like this and you're working with Razor and you see that at sign, that at sign is a directive indicating, hey, this is Razor code, right? This is not HTML. Um, when we have a comment in Razor, we go ampersand star, star ampersand. So all of this is a comment. This, however, is an ampersand and there's curly brackets. And that's where we're actually going to put our code. Now they do have some code in the instructions here and um, right down here. So inside those curly brackets, we want to add this view data. In fact, you know, it might be easier to just copy all of this and replace all that code. So I, that's what I just did. So I'm going to go back to Visual Studio, and then I'm going to replace all the code here at the bottom. Let's control Z that. You know, and in fact, you know, you can get rid of the comments too. That doesn't really matter. Um, all right. So inside the Razor code, we are going to push out now some new information. So they do want us to run the app 
right? So we'll, let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to come here. I'm going to do a control F5. So here comes the run. This time it popped up on screen number two for whatever reason. Um, and they want us to go to the Hello World page. So let's let's append um, just Hello World. And you can see, right? And, and I'm trying to do this so you can see both things at the same time, um, that it is uh, pushing out the regular HTML that's on the page there. So if you want, you can hard code HTML into this stuff. It's not really that hard to do. You know, if it's not gonna be dynamic, it doesn't really matter, right? Um, this could be images, regular links, any HTML thing you can do, you can put it in there. Now, because we're using the bootstrap template, right? Because it came along with this MVC model, we're automatically in that format. So when I have an individual page, that has content, right? It's automatically fitting in that format. So I don't have a header and a footer and all that jazz, right? I, I'm just worried about the content inside the body. You'll also notice that there's this other little thing up here um, at the top, which is, you know, these are razor directives. And notice what, the, what they're doing here is they're pushing view data title equals index, right? All right, so what the heck does, does that actually do? Um, well, where do you think this title is coming from? Okay, well, it's coming from here, right? I don't know if that's really helpful. That's not really a great name for it, um, but that is uh, where it's going. So in other words, the, the title um, for the page, and actually, and I'm being mistaken here, and I, and I apologize. Let's go back to that for a second. Um, you know, is index, but the index that we're seeing on the page is from that H2, so I apologize. I didn't mean to confuse that, that particular uh, portion of it. The, the fact that um, the page loads up, right, is it it is looking to return a view. The view is now found here in the folder with the same name as the controller. And because we're triggering the index action, it's triggering the index code, which then pushes it back to the view. And that's kind of the, the mechanics, right? And in the browser, you can see that it's pushing it out from this file, right? Because that, that text is is unique. All right. Uh, next step we have to perform here, right, is um, to change the views and the layout pages. And it says select the menu uh, links, MVC, movie, home, and privacy. And it shows you um, that every page has the same menu layout. And that basically that layout is dictated in this file, right? Makes sense. It's a shared thing. The menu is a shared thing and it's in that layout file. All right. Um, so let, let's take a look at that file. So what they're saying here is that when, um, you know, the app is running, which it still is, right? And I click here or here or here or wherever, um, that the menu that we see is generated from that file. So if you come in here, you go to the shared folder under views, and then you bring out the layout, layout CSHTML. You can see, first of all, you know, the doc type in the header and all the HTML tags that we don't see elsewhere, the menu, right? Um, and then ultimately somewhere is the container that holds the body of the document. And when we render body, this is the spot where we're pushing our content into. So whatever razor code we have, whatever um, HTML we've written up, that's where it gets injected. All the rest of it is controlled here. So if I didn't like, you know, for example, if I wanted to just, like stop using Bootstrap, I could just comment this out. Or if I didn't want to use 
this particular style sheet or whatever style sheets we have, um, here's a spot where I can change that. Notice that the title for the page, right, which goes in the tab of the browser is set with razor code here. So it's dynamic, right? So in other words, it's almost kind of like a variable. I can like inject based upon the title. What am I interjecting here on this page? Well, this is going to be MVC movie, but I could adjust that any way I want. And, and any of the code here, right? If I don't like the, the, the styles, the classes, the layout, the order, any of that stuff can be changed, right? But this is the spot where it all is held. And that's in the layout uh, CSHTML file. Notice the underscore before it, before it right? Back to my tutorial here. All right, so layout templates allow specifying the HTML container layout of one site in one place, applying the HTML container layout across multiple pages in the site. Right? So, you know, if you have a nice looking framework, you don't need to recreate it each time. It makes no sense, right? You just do it once, then inject your other front. All right, now it says find the render body line. Um, so let's do that. Let's go here. Just to kind of look at it again. And they're saying it's a placeholder where all the view specific pages you create show up wrapped in the layout page. So if, you know, their, their point kind of is like, if I go to the you know, privacy page, this content is declared in the privacy page. And, and the other thing you can always do too is you can do it like a, like a view source or an inspect or whatever. And you can find, you know, how that stuff actually gets injected, right? You know, if you really want to look at uh, main, role, main, class, PV3, right? You can find that here, role, main, class, PV3. So here's the stuff that's getting injected. And then if I go into the privacy page that's pre-created well there you go there's your h1 and there's your paragraph just like we see here right you know so there's the connection right so uh the privacy page is just one that's pre-generated because they figure everybody needs a privacy policy you know to tell people you're stealing their data basically um all right now what we're going to do here um is we're going to go ahead and we're going to change the title footer and menu link in the layout file. So we're going to do these one at a time. All right. So the green highlights are the things you need to change. So if, you, if you're kind of working on your own here, so I'm just going to grab these one at a time. I think all they're changing here is they're saying movie app. Let me just go and check that really quick. So we're going to go back to the index, no, excuse me, the controller file. No, I'm sorry. The index CSHTML, and I'm, I'm confusing myself here. All right, let's go back to the layout page. That's where we want to be. And we're changing this from MVC movie to movie app. That's, that's the big change, right? Uh, movie app, they're still pushing the title. There's a dash in there, movie app. All right, so that's the first change. The next change is to change the nav bar brand. And I think with this one, I'm probably gonna capture the whole line. Just grab that. So that would be this. Now what I'm gonna do here, just for the sake of comparison, here's the new one. I'm just trying to see what, what they're changing. Okay, so they're just changing movies and movie app. Right, so I'm going to get rid of this one. And if you think about it, this is uh, like the first link in the navigation. All right, so that, that's change number two. Um, then we're going to take this change here. So in the footer, in the div class container, we're going to add this code. So in the footer, 
in the div class container, I'm removing this and replacing it with this. Slightly different, right? Um, notice we're doing a copyright. Probably should put in the current year. We're changing the name to movie app. Um, all right. And that couple of ASP tags in here. And then uh, the ASP action is privacy when you click on the link. Okay. So that's kind of interesting too, because you can actually specify from, from a link that you're triggering a certain action once again. All right, so we're, we've made all three changes. All right, all right let's, let's go ahead and go back to the browser now for a second. And I wanna make sure I'm going to the right one. I am gonna close the running instance and repropagate. So control F5 to relaunch. And welcome the browser here. Of course, I can't find the tab. All right, so let's do that again. Control five. I don't see it launching in any <laughs> any of my other. Uh, workspaces here let me close some extraneous tabs here and you know what maybe maybe even better maybe i should save my work let's do a save all i'm looking at the console here so i'm not sure if i'm like full-on crashed or what the deal is all right one more time clicking inside visual studio doing control f5 all right, I, I seem to be dead in the water. So here's here's my strategy on this. <laughs> Stop and restart uh, Visual Studio. That is a little bit extreme, but if that happens to you, I mean, you gotta have some sort of a strategy. That's mine for the moment. I'm just looking at the little system messages there. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna go ahead and do a control F5. All right, now it did launch. Of course, screen number two, of, as usual. Um, and it's up. And then what they wanna kind of point out here is that we just changed the footer, right? We can click on the privacy thing to get there. Uh, you'll notice that the menu has changed, right? It's a better name. Um, and that the navigation is still all working, right? And if we look at the title up here in the tab, which we changed also, that also changed to movie app. So we're okay. Movie app, movie app, movie app. Those are basically the changes that we made. So we successfully... Uh, change the header and the footer uh, and the title. All right. Now, one thing that, that's kind of um, interesting that's happening here, so save, save the changes, select the privacy link that we already did that one. Um, and what they're trying to point out is when we go to the privacy page, it says, notice how the title on the browser tab dis displays privacy policy movie app instead of privacy policy MVC movie. Okay, so that I think that is pretty helpful to note. Um, then it says, select the home link, right? So what's the home link? This one, right? Um, and it says the title and the anchor text display movie app. So homepage movie app. Right. And it says the changes were made once in the layout template and all the pages on the site reflect the new link and text. Right. So I think that that is pretty helpful. Next, they want us to look at the view start uh, CS HTML file, which is um, right down here. So you notice that 
and that's actually not in any of the subfolders. It's in the root of views. So I'm just going to click views start. And it has a directive inside of it that just says the layout equals underscore layout. So what layout are you using? Oh, we're using layout, <laughs> basically, right? Um, so in other words, this is a way in Razor, right, to say, okay, we, well, what page layout are you using? Well, here, we're using this one. Okay, so now that should really give you a couple of ideas, right? So if I um, want to choose a different layout, I could point to that, right? Or I could just name it something else. I don't know why you would do that, but you could, right? Um, and the, the, the usefulness of this, to me at least, is that we can use this to choose either different layouts or to ignore the layouts altogether. So like the other option, and they say this in the instructions, is you can set it to, to null and then no layout file will be used, right? Um, all right, so not necessarily uh, useful, I think. But now they want us to go to this folder, the hello world folder, and then take a look at the index CSHTML file inside hello world views, right? They want us to change a couple of things in here. So the first thing they want us to do is change the view data title thing. Instead of saying index, let's call it what it is, which is a movie list, right? And then inside the H2, index also isn't particularly useful. So let's also rename that and call it well, they're doing this, my movie list. Okay, simple HTML changes. And then, you know, whatever, generic text here, right? Um, all right. Uh, they make a couple of points here about what you're changing, right? And I think, all right, so let, let me just show you what I'm looking at on my screen here. Right, so we did all this stuff. Um, yeah, we just made these changes here. And then they're, they're kind of making this point. It says the title and H2 element are slightly different, so it's clear which part of the code the changes, uh, changes the display. Uh, the view data title movie list sets the title property of the view data dictionary to movie list, and then the title property is used in the title element on the layout page, right? So in other words, um, this feeds that layout and then fills this title. Right? Well, that, that's kind of the point of that. Um, right. And then, so in other words, that will get propagated uh, into this spot. And just make sure that that's changed. And I thought we already did this change, but now, you know, it's making me second guess myself for sure. That's the view start. I don't think I need that open anymore, but the layout and then index. And I'm trying to see here, where are they asking us to actually change this in the above? In the code above title sets property, the title property is used in the title HTML layout page. Let, let's go ahead. I'm not saying that I actually have to make a change here. I think you're just pointing it out. I think that's what it is. So I'm going to go ahead. Let's do a save on that file, right? The index.cshtml file. And then I'm going to go ahead and repropagate this. So control F5 to launch. And there it is. All right. And then they want us to navigate to the world. So I'm doing it. And there it is. And notice, you know, what they're trying to point out is once again that uh, title, movie app, movie app, my movie list, all of you know that change. So the browser title changed, the primary heading changed and the secondary headings changed as well. Right, so I think that's that's pretty slick uh, and pretty simple, really. 
and i'm wondering if this is working correctly now that i'm looking at it are you guys getting the same results as i am i'm still getting a um 404 error when i click the movie app right well yeah you shouldn't have to type type movie app i mean we're still hitting hello world that's the controller that we're operating oh right um sorry my my maybe my mic was too far um when i click the, on the movie app on the um the navigation bar it gives me a 404 error oh uh, yeah oh oh it, it's still going to yours okay all right i thought you clicked that to get to that yeah there, i'm sorry there's a reason for that right and, and and if you think about it the reason is we haven't created a view for it so when we hit it it doesn't know where to go okay yeah all right i clicked yeah, I, I typed in hello world and it's i'm i'm working i'm i'm back to where you are all right great. <laughs> good good to hear all right let's let's keep rolling on it then um all right and it says okay so if you and this is kind of an important thing to know so i'm just gonna i'm gonna pull up the tutorial thing here right it says if you hit the browser and there's no changes. It says it could be that the that the content's already cached in your browser, um, and then they're they're showing you how to refresh your browser from scratch, which, which once again is a Control F5, right? So it's a refresh, and that forces it to respond from the server to be loaded, right? If you guys didn't know that trick, and and this is kind of a, a and they're, I think they're moving away from this, but in in the old days it was F5 to refresh your browser. And control F5 to refresh, but I think in some of the more modern versions of Windows and in the browsers, they want you to do Control R or Control Shift R to do the forced uh, refresh. Yeah, now I am seeing, you know, one thing where we do have a difference, right? And, and yeah, and, and what they're saying is the content in the index file view template is merged with the layout right and we get a single html response and do you guys notice one difference between what they're doing and what we get is their thing it says movie list movie app i don't think mine says that so maybe i should try running it again uh, let's do that quick no harm done. mine gets that Okay, it does. So, so then I screwed something up. Oh no, I am getting that. Okay, never mind. <laughs> All right, my mind's telling me one thing, and whatever. Um, yeah, and okay. So they're they're saying here, and I think this is kind of interesting. The small bit of data, the hello from our view template message, is hard coded. However. Uh, the application has a view, a controller, but no model yet. So that's where we're going next, if you're not guessing. So we got to pass data now from the controller to the view um, and then see what happens. So I, I, and I'm looking kind of at uh, how far we are here. And I'm not sure we're going to get as far as we thought we did, but we'll, you know, we'll, we'll try. <laughs> right. All right. So it says uh, passing data from the controller to the view. It says controller actions are invoked in response to an incoming URL request. A controller class is where the code is written that handles the incoming browser request. The controller re retrieves the data from the data source and decides what type of response to send back to the browser. View templates can be used from a controller to generate and format an HTML response, okay? Controllers are responsible for providing the data required in order for a view to template to render a response. So view templates sh should not do any business logic or interact with the database directly. So we never go from the view to the database. A view template should work only with the data that's provided to it by the controller, maintaining this separation of concerns. And it helps keep the code clean, testable, and maintainable. And it says currently the welcome method in the hello world controller class takes a name and an ID parameter and then outputs the values directly to the browser. Rather than have the controller render this response as a string, change the controller to use a view template instead. And the view template, which generates a, a dynamic response, which means that an appropriate data, that appropriate data must be passed from the controller to the view to generate the response. And do this by having the controller put the dynamic data, 
the parameters that the view template needs in the view data dictionary and the view template can then access the dynamic data. Boy, that's a mouthful and I'm sorry I'm meeting it folks, but kind of important to convey it, I think. Um, so in the hello world controller, change the welcome method to add a message and number of times value to the view data dictionary, right? So in other words, you're gonna build a little bit of a data structure or whatever. Um, and that object has no defined properties until something is added. The, the model binding system automatically maps the name parameters names and number of time from the query string to the parameters in the method. Uh, all right, so we're basically gonna change that welcome thing around a little bit. So I recommend that you copy all of that code, right? And this is going in the hello world controller file. So that's gonna go in this file here. And then we're replacing the whole method. And the reason for that is, because once again, the original one was returning a string and then it had its own return statement, which we really kind of don't need anymore. Now we're changing that also to an action result, which means it's triggering a method, right? Um, notice that we're still doing the parameters of string name and int number of times. And then the view data, right, is, and this is kind of interesting, right? Because it, it, it's showing up kind of like as, you know, data inside or an attribute inside of an object, or, you know, you notice the square brackets, right? That's kind of indicative too, is, is this an array? You know, it's kind of what your brain should be thinking. So the view data, which we're calling message is gonna be hello, plus whatever name we send it. And the view data number of times is just going to be outputting the number, and then it's going to return a view, right? So, you know, we're having the one action call another action is what, what's happening, right? I'm doing a control S to save, by the way, right? It says the view data dictionary object contains data that will be passed to the view. And then we're going to create um, a welcome view template named views hello world welcome CS HTML, right? Um, so I want you to think about um, that we need to create another file here, right? Uh, and then we're gonna create a loop and this will be kind of a, a, a really good demonstration, I think of, of, of where Razor can do some things that maybe you haven't thought about before. All right, so let's go ahead and create a welcome view template named as follows. So notice where it's placed under views, under hello world, um, and as a separate file called welcome. So under view, under hello world, and then we're gonna add, and what is this gonna be? Is this gonna be a view? That That's a question you should ask yourself. And I'm not sure if they specify that in the instructions like, um, yeah, they, it is gonna be a view. So we're gonna say add, view, right? Um, you know, I think that, I think it's pretty intuitive at this point. We'll probably go once again with the empty, right? Since it's already selected, we're gonna go ahead and add. Um, we're gonna call it welcome.cs, oops, sorry, cs html. I should not have deleted that. And then we're going to go ahead and add. All right, so there it is. Once again, this is comments. You can blow it away if you wish. <laughs> and then they give us some code. In fact, I'm just going to highlight all this code. And then they give us, <coughs> excuse me, this code to replace it with. So, and of course, that did not copy from where I copied it from. So I'm copying it from my other screen, if you're wondering. All right, but I am basically. Uh, grabbing it from this dialogue. Right. So now if you look at that code we just pasted, so once again, we have a view data title. So now we're gonna be injecting the name welcome. We have an H2 that says welcome. And then of course we have an unordered list, right? We see a CUL tag here. And normally think about how you do an unordered list, right? You do a UL and then you have list items. And I do see a list item in here, right? And then for however many bullets you want, you 
include a, an LI tag, right? List item, uh, open and close, put your stuff in between. But now we're marrying it with, with Razor. And first of all, inside the one list item that we have, we have a Razor directive that is gonna read the message, right? Whatever that happens to be, right? Dynamically. The other thing that's happening is here's another razor directive. And then notice that basically this is just C sharp code for doing a loop, right? A for loop. And what it's going to do is basically um, for, uh, you know, I set to zero, as long as I is less than the number of times specified in the parameter that we're passing, uh, it's going to put the message on the screen. So now it's going to repeat. Right, so now we're going to see a, a repetition, basically depending on the number of times you pass to your browser. Um, so let's let's try this out. First, do a save. If you have the app running, I kind of think I don't. Okay, I don't. Um, then go ahead and do your Control F five to launch. Let's get that up and, and rolling here. All right, and then we are going to append to the URL, the same thing that they're indicating in the instructions, which is hello world slash welcome, question mark name, Rick, and number of times for. So we're back to the old original way of pushing stuff in there. But this time when I press enter, you notice the title. Okay, the title in the tab, the title on the page, and then a UL, which took the name, married it to hello, and then repeated it four times based on the number four that we passed in, right? Now this is pretty powerful stuff. So we're sending data in, it's reading the data, acting upon it, and then generating a view dynamically based upon the data that we sent it, right? We're still not interacting with the model, but we're sending data, processing it, and sending something back to the screen and it's working as we are uh, intending. Let me see if I can, find a way to maybe at least finish out this page here um, or to see if this is actually a logical stopping point. I don't wanna kind of interrupt our flow, but I, I think I'm gonna have to. All right, so we did finish this page. So we got up through, um, we did add a controller, add a view, and next time we will add a model. Um, now the way that I have the homework um, structured, I believe model and database stuff are, are due next week. So if you guys feel ambitious and wanna go ahead and complete those on your own, that's fine. What I'm gonna to try to do is um, just kind of maybe think about adjusting that first due date a little bit, cause I do wanna cover it in, in, in video format. If I get ambitious and I'm saying very unlikely if here and have enough time to kind of walk th through these two sections and just record them on my own and then publish them, I will do that. If not, we just have to revisit next week. So we'll see. Um, that is uh, the conclusion, at least of this portion. Um, and um, this video will end here.